You have your Bibles this afternoon, and you would be kind enough to join me in the 11th chapter of the book of, of Acts. You could call Acts the second book of Luke, as it was written by the Apostle Luke. And it was a continuation of the book, the gospel that bears his name. But in Acts chapter 11, the first 18 verses, it's a rather long section this afternoon. I read today from the King James text. And I'll put it on the screen for those today in the building so you can see it behind me. Amen. Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and did eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheep, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Amen. If you bow your heads with me once again, as we go to the Lord in prayer, Master, once again, God, we come to you at this hour because it is the moment in the service when the Word of God must go forth. And if there is any time 
in any service, Lord, when we need the help of the Holy Ghost that is in the preaching of the Word of God. Any man, any woman, any individual who would stand in the sacred desk in the pulpit and not recognize their need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Lord, they're on a fool's errand. Oh, Master, today more than anything in my heart, I desire to preach the Word of God effectively, to preach it in a manner, God, that is pleasing in your sight. So when I stand before you on the judgment day, you'll be able to look my way and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I gave you a message to preach to my people, and you faithfully delivered that message. Help me, Lord, to do what you've called me to do, for without you, I can do nothing. Help the hearer to receive the word of God with gladness that it might become the engrafted word and not merely a word which is heard and passes over our hearing, but rather, O oh God, that it might become the engrafted word, that it might become uh, engraved upon the tablet of our heart. Master, we ask all this today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle... Peter has just returned to Jerusalem from an amazing occurrence. Something that quite shocked him and the Jewish brethren who had traveled with him <coughs> to the house of one Roman centurion named Simon. This Centurion had received word from an angel that he was to send men to the city of Joppa and to require of one named uh, to, acquire, to uh, inquire of one named Peter and to bring Peter back because Peter had a message, the angel said, that would bring salvation to this man's house. So he did as he was instructed. And Simon Peter the Apostle was the one that he was inquiring of. And Simon Peter and six of his Jewish brethren. At this point the church consisted only of Jewish converts. The church was just weeks old, months old at this point. And only the message had been preached within the confines of Judea, meaning the Jewish uh, territories. And they had only seen Jewish converts primarily at this point. And so probably in their thinking, I would imagine the apostles very much believed that the gospel was a Jewish gospel. God had promised the Messiah through the Jewish people. He had promised the restoration of Israel. And he had promised the establishment of an eternal throne through Israel. So why would the apostles not believe then that the gospel was given to Israel for Israel and pretty much think that it was for Israel alone? Well, that appears to have been the mindset because as Peter returns to Jerusalem, the apostles and the brethren at Jerusalem are actually upset with him. They're disturbed with him and they begin to debate with him and hold him accountable because he had gone against one of the primary ordinances of the law and he had gone into the home of a Gentile and eaten with that Gentile and they couldn't quite understand why. 
So Peter went into telling the lengthy tale of how he had been praying and God gave him a vision. And in this vision, a sheep came down from heaven and opened and within that sheep were all kinds of animals. Every one of which the law labeled unclean and unholy. And the voice of God spake from heaven three times to Peter and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. <clears throat> and Peter answered, <clears throat> as so many religious people will, Oh, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is unclean or unholy. I've never broken the commandment. I've never gone against your divine law and done such a thing. And the voice of the Lord comes back and says to Peter, Peter, that which I have sanctified, that which I have cleansed, that which I have called holy, don't you dare call it unclean or unholy. I'm going to tell you, God wouldn't ask you to get up and eat it if he had not first somehow sanctified it because God don't ask you to break his own rules. Mm -hmm. God doesn't tell us to do something contrary to what he has otherwise commanded us to do. Even though <laughs> at times that may seem to be what is happening. As Peter at the house of Cornelius, I said earlier his name was Simon. The centurion's name was Cornelius. I'm telling you, these allergies are giving my brain a little bit of a hiccup today. Amen. As Peter went into the home of Cornelius and shared with them the message of Jesus Christ. Listen, in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and 45, this was the actual occurrence, the actual event. And the Word of God states, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the Word. And they of the circumcision which believed the six who had gone with Peter to the house of Cornelius were astonished as many as came with Peter because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were astonished, the Jews at Jerusalem, the converts to the Christian faith, of Jewish descent at Jerusalem were upset with Peter because he had gone in to Gentiles. And yet it is not as though Peter and the other apostles had not been told that the gospel would also include the Gentile world. It's not as though the Lord had not made clear that the Holy Ghost would be given to the Jew and Gentile alike. In Acts 1 and 8, Jesus is recorded to have said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Peter himself had preached. It's amazing how preachers can preach something and not even be aware of the truth they're speaking. Peter himself had preached on the day of Pentecost concerning the gift of the Holy Ghost that had been poured out upon the church. And as those in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Pentecost inquired, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter, Acts 2, 38 and 39, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, for the promise is unto you and to your children 
and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter had preached this very message. I'm going to tell you, there are times, folks, when the anointing gets on a preacher, and I kid you, and I know this from personal experience, <coughs> and we'll come out with things, we'll say things under the anointing, and this is why I watch my own messages online after a while. Every week I go back and watch, because under the anointing, sometimes it's amazing the things that will come out of me, and then when I hear it, it's like I never spoke it. It, it literally it, it hits me between the eyes. Here Peter had preached the promises unto you, to them that are far off, to even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And yet, when he's called to the house of a Gentile, well, didn't the Lord say you that you would receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you? Didn't he say you'd preach in, all, in Jerusalem and all Judea and unto Samaria and unto the uttermost part of it? Didn't he say that? Don't, don't you put these pieces, Peter, together of the puzzle and recognize that the Gentile would also be included in the gospel? Even within the context of the Old Testament law, the Lord clearly spoke of His promise of salvation, making it abundantly clear that even those whom the law had excluded would be included when the salvation of the Lord was revealed through the Messiah. In Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 7, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger or the immigrant that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. So even in the Old Testament, God had made it abundantly clear that salvation was of the Jews, but it was not for the Jews alone. Hallelujah. The Word of God promised that through Messiah, <coughs> excuse me, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Amen. In John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25, John the Apostle finishes his account of the gospel with these words. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Listen to what John says. And there are also many other things 
things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. That's what John wrote. At the end of the gospel that bears his name, John said, Folks, I've got news for you today. There are things which Jesus did. There are things which Jesus spoke that I haven't even covered. I haven't even gone into. He said they've not even been pinned to paper. He said, if everything the Lord said and did were put to paper, he said, I doubt that every book on earth could contain the whole of it. Well, if that be true, then that tells us today that the Word of God, the Bible, does not contain everything, does it? No. At the end of the gospel which bears his name, the apostle John makes this marvelous declaration where everything to have been written that the Lord Jesus Christ said and did during the course of his earthly ministry, the whole of the world's books could not contain all that would have been penned to paper. Some would have us to believe today that everything we might ever need to know or everything we might ever need to hear has been given to us in the form of the printed Word of God. But this is not true. There are many subjects the Bible does not even touch upon. Theologians and preachers will try to twist and contort the Word of God in order to make it speak concerning subjects upon which there is nothing written. But I'm here to tell you today, God is speaking to the church and He is saying, I haven't finished speaking. There is nothing more frustrating then sometimes you watch a presidential debate or you watch politicians debate on television and one will try to speak over the other and the one who was speaking will say hey hold up I haven't finished speaking <laughs> I haven't finished my point yet I haven't finished saying what I need to say I've got news for you today church God is saying to the church I haven't finished speaking just because you have the printed word of God does not mean you have everything you need to hear no there is a reason why God gave the Holy Ghost to the church there is a reason why God has filled his people with the Holy Ghost and with power and the reason for that simply is this he has not finished speaking he needs an avenue whereby he is still able to speak to the church Peter was on the rooftop he had all kinds of ideas about who the gospel was for and who the gospel was to be applied to and who it was meant for. And yet God had something to say. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. If it had not been for the Holy Ghost speaking to Peter on the rooftop, we today still might not be in the church. The Gentile world today still might not be included in the gospel. But God, by the Holy Ghost, spoke to Peter and caused Peter to understand something that he had overlooked and that he had misunderstood. There are a lot of people out there today who don't understand this old LGBT affirming preacher. Oh, they want to argue and debate with me like they did with Peter when Peter got home from the house of Cornelius. But I'm here to tell you, honey, the Holy Ghost spoke to me, hallelujah, and helped me to understand that there were some things the Word of God says that I didn't really understand and I really didn't get and I really wasn't focused on and I really wasn't 
and tuned into. It's not that God is contradicting himself, but rather that he is clarifying himself. The Holy Ghost for years spoke to me. For years. While I was backsliding out of church, the Spirit of the Lord kept speaking to me and kept saying to me, I get you. I understand you. You know, you're out of church. You're away from me. You've walked away from your relationship with me. But you don't need to be where you are. You don't need to be what you're do, do what you're doing. You don't need to think what you're thinking. Because I'm here to tell you what you're thinking is not what I'm thinking. Hallelujah. And God kept speaking to me over and over again. And he kept saying to me, Charles, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Son, wake up. What on earth makes you think there's one single believer in the church who hasn't got something in their life mm -hmm. that the law the law would condemn them over? Mm -hmm. What makes you think there isn't something in every believer's life? Have I not said that all your righteousness is as filthy rags. Haven't I said that? Do you not get that? Mm -hmm. Have I not said through the Apostle John that if you say you have no sin, then you're calling me a liar and the truth is not in you? Have, don't you understand? You see, what happens is certain movements and certain uh, segments of the Christian population, they love to focus in on this scripture here or that scripture there, but they they don't take the whole and they don't apply the message as a whole. You cannot take any singular part, any passage from the Bible out of context and think that you're going to get a truth from it. No, what you're going to get is confused and boggled and, and mixed up because the truth of the matter is it is one big puzzle, but God's done that on purpose. He said, I want people to see it who make the effort to see it. The Bible said that if we would come to God, we must first believe that He is, number one, that He exists, but listen, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. See, there are a lot of people who believe that God is, but they do not diligently seek Him. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy that he was to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because in order to understand the message of the part, you have to understand the message of the whole. You got to get the whole picture. You got to be able to take all the pieces and piece them together and fix them together so you see the whole picture and not just a part. There are movements, the Pentecostal movement. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal movement. I love the Pentecostal movement. I, to this day, I love the Pentecostal movement. I, I don't have any gripes or complaints. Now, there's a lot of stuff goes on in it I'm not happy about today. I'm not endorsing everything that everyone does, but I can tell you in my experience growing up as a kid, going through some of the things I went through, the church I grew up in was a lifesaver for me, folks. It was heaven on earth for me. There was no place in the world that I'd rather be than in the church house when I was growing up as a kid. When we sing that song, come and go with me to my father's house where there is peace. <coughs> peace, sweet peace. I promise you, growing up as a kid, I'd go into the church of God, I'd go into the house of God, and my God, there was peace there. There was tranquility there. It was, in fact, a sanctuary for me. 
and for all the garbage that I was going through at home, for all the garbage I was going through at school, for all the garbage I was going through in the world, every Sunday I'd go into the house of God and I'd be empowered and inspired and encouraged so that I could push through the garbage for another week and I could make it till the next Sunday and then God would fill my tank again and I'd be able to go another week and I'd come back in and he'd fill my tank again and I could go another week. So yeah, I'm sorry if you had a bad experience growing up in a Pentecostal church. My experience wasn't so bad. My experience was a lifesaver. It was a godsend for me and I'm grateful for it. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. The Pentecostal movement is absolutely one of the movements that has taken certain passages and certain portions of Scripture and they've run with it and they've gone with it and they drilled it into people's heads and they preached that particular line of reasoning and that particular line and they failed to see the whole for gagging on the part. The Lord Jesus Christ worded it this way to the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you gag at gnats and swallow camels. See, little things they get all choked up on. And yet at the same time, they're missing the bigger picture. They're not seeing the whole. Oh my goodness, it took me years to finally come to understand this, but thank God I finally did. But I only did because God has not finished speaking. He gave me the Holy Ghost as a child. And that Holy Ghost, he said, would never leave me nor forsake me. And even when I was out of church, even when I was in the clubs and in the bars, and even when I was doing some of the filthiest, skankiest, most horrible stuff I could ever do, I have the Holy Ghost in me. And that voice of God was speaking. And the voice of the Lord kept saying to me over and over again, Charles, I haven't finished speaking. I haven't finished speaking. Don't you start talking yet. Don't you think you know something you don't know yet. I haven't finished speaking. And then he'd remind me of things and he'd talk to me about things. And if it wasn't for the reality of the Holy Ghost in the church today, there would not be one person on this planet who knows the truth of God that's able to set them free. The Word of God is called by Jesus. The Lord says, in one place, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. In another place, the Lord says, That thy spirit is truth. Well, wait a minute, Lord. If the word is truth, and the spirit is truth, then what is truth? That's, that's a question that has been asked over the centuries. What is truth? And the answer comes back, oh, it's rather easy if you think about it. Hydrogen is not water and oxygen is not water. But when you put hydrogen together with oxygen in the right quantities, you wind up with water. So the word is truth and the spirit is truth. But if you're going to have the whole truth and nothing but the truth, guess what you've got to have? You've got to have a combination of the two. You've got to have the word and you've got to have the spirit. If you're trying to define, if you're trying to interpret the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, which my friend, you can get mad at me all you want to get mad at me. But when you stand before God in the judgment, you're never going to be able to say to him that this preacher didn't warn you. The Baptist tradition is a man-made tradition in the Christian world. 
It is strictly based on human beings trying to interpret the Word of God in the absence of the leadership of the Holy Ghost. They reject the infilling. They reject the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, if you reject the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how in the world do you expect the Holy Ghost to be involved in your understanding and interpreting and, and uh, acknowledging the Word of God? You've rejected half of the ingredient necessary. Oh, but preacher, I know in my Baptist church they talk about the Holy Ghost all the time. Sure they do. They probably talk about love all the time too. But they're hateful, they're malicious, they're anti-gay, they're homophobic. So just because you talk about something doesn't mean you got it. It's true. You see, God gave the Holy Ghost to the church for a reason. Because that allows His voice to continue to speak. You see, what separates Christianity from every other religion on the face of planet Earth, not the Baptist brand of Christianity, not the Presbyterian band of Christian, brand of Christianity, not the Episcopalian brand or the Catholic brand or any other brand, what separates the the apostolic Pentecostal brand of Christianity from every other religion in the world is we not only preach a risen Christ but we preach that the risen living Christ by reason of his spirit wants to live in you and through you and that when he does this, his voice can be heard in you and through you. The gifts of the Spirit, which we read about in 1 Corinthians, the gifts of the Spirit are given so that God can speak to and through his church. The gift of prophecy is so that our living God can speak to his church directly through the prophetic. The gift of tongues with interpretation is given so that God can speak to and through his church directly. What makes Pentecost different than anything else that is called Christian in the world today is that Pentecost does not merely preach that you ought to believe in a risen, resurrected Christ, but that after you've believed in a risen, resurrected Christ, you are to receive His Spirit. It's called the Holy Ghost baptism, and God will make Himself real to you. You will know that God is real because He literally will affect one of the most primary aspects of the human condition, and that is your speech. He'll actually enable you to speak in another language by His Spirit. And it's a simple thing. He doesn't talk through you. You don't have God's voice coming through you. You don't have another spirit speaking through you. No. God literally turns your spirit on. And when He does, He flips a switch so that you, 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 are able to speak another language. You're talking, and in most people, when they get the Holy Ghost, the thing that surprises them is they say, I just thought I was talking. They didn't realize they were speaking. Yes, they were speaking, but they were speaking in another language because literally it's still all you. The Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all they, uh, they were all gathered together in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they all began to speak with other tongues, meaning in a different language, a language they did not know. They all begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance, meaning as God enabled them to do so. 
You see, this message that we preach today, we don't get up and say, oh, this book says that a man named Jesus lived. This book says that a man named Jesus died. This book says that a man named Jesus rose from the dead. And then you're supposed to believe what this book says. That's not our message today. Not in the apostolic church it isn't. No, we say, this book says a man named Jesus lived. This book says a man named Jesus died. This book says a man named Jesus uh, rose again from the dead. And that you're to believe this. And let me tell you what else this book says. It says, if you believe this, that this same Jesus, this exact same Jesus, will come down from heaven in an invisible spiritual form, and he will fill you to the brim with his own power and with his own presence and he will make himself real to you and you will be able to hear his voice and you will be able to receive direction and guidance from him well that's quite a lot different than just this book says therefore you're supposed to believe it no the Pentecostal faith, the faith of Scripture, the apostolic message, the message preached by the apostles was a message that went far beyond believe this. No, it's if you believe this, you're going to receive this. If you receive this, then you're going to know God is real. I'm going to tell you a little secret. God been real to me as the nose on my face ever since I was a kid. I grew up going through hell. I went through some terrible things growing up as a kid. But I'm going to tell you something. God was as real to me as the nose on my face. Because as a little five-year-old boy, I went down to the altar. Brother Kautz, an evangelist of German descent, had come and preached for our church. And he invited folks that wanted God to fill them with the Holy Ghost to come down to the altar. This little five-year-old, I was a little precocious. So I might have been a, a little bit older in my thinking. Uh, my cognitive abilities than many five year olds but I went down to that altar and I asked God to fill me with the Holy Ghost and I'm here to tell you today that five year old kid was in the altar nobody was near me nobody was standing in front of me saying say this or say that and all of a sudden I began to bop 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 and bop 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 and as I was speaking and as I was praying I was praying and speaking in an unknown tongue in a language that was not known to this little five year old kid and I went home from church that night excited because God had filled me with the Holy Ghost and he had made himself forever real to me I love people who think they don't need the Holy Ghost baptism well God's real to me God's plenty real I don't need the Holy Ghost God's plenty real to me <laughs> you think so do you you know why you think so? Because you ain't got the Holy Ghost. If you had the Holy Ghost, then you would understand that what you think feels real to you today is nothing compared to what it is after you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, it's like people who think they know somebody. Oh, I know so-and-so. I know this person. Well, I've been going to church with them for 30 years, honey. You can go to church with them for 100 years, and you still ain't going to know that person. I've lived with people that I went to church with, and boy, howdy, I found out real fast that what I thought they were, who I thought they were, based on my experience with them in church, was a whole lot different than who I found out they were when I actually had to live with them. And that includes members of my own family. You think you know them. Well, I've, I've had enough experience with God. I know God's real. No, you don't. You need the Holy Ghost. You still need the Holy Ghost baptism. Don't you ever let the devil convince you you don't need the Holy Ghost baptism. Because the Holy Ghost baptism makes God real to you in a way that nothing on this planet can possibly make God real to you like there's something about this experience that makes God so abundantly real hallelujah 
In John chapter 14, verses 23 and through 26, the Word of God said, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is far more than a belief system based upon an ancient text. It is a living, breathing faith that is nourished, encouraged, and informed by both the written word and the instruction and guidance of God's Spirit, which He has given the church as an inheritance and a birthright. The gospel brings us into relationship with the Lord. The Holy Spirit brings us then into an intimacy that no man can know except for the blessed infilling and indwelling of God's own Spirit. It is the Spirit within which helps us to better understand the written word. It is the Spirit within which helps us to rightly divide the word of God. It is the Spirit within that speaks to us directly from the very throne of God in order to clarify, rebuke, or encourage. And also to fill in any blanks that might exist where the written word is silent. The Spirit will never admonish us to do contrary to the sound doctrine of God's word, but by the same token, the Spirit can challenge, and historically it has challenged, the church to re-examine its understanding of issues which it may have an erroneously believed it fully understood. See, Peter thought he understood how a Jew was to interact with Gentiles. But it was the voice of God on that rooftop that helped him to understand, no, Peter, that I've said things that you're missing. I've said things you're not understanding. I've said things that you've overlooked. By the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you've spoken things that you're not even understanding yourself. My goodness. In John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, the Lord Jesus Christ said, These things have I written unto you, Excuse me, it's John the Apostle in 1 John 2, 26 and 27. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduced you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. You have to remember, the early church for centuries did not have what we today call the Bible. Most, most congregations in the first, second, and third centuries of the Christian church were blessed if they had in their possession one single epistle, a copy of one single epistle. So 
How in the world did they keep their doctrine straight? How in the world did they keep their beliefs right? How in the world was God able to keep the church from falling into all kinds of error and all kinds of false teaching and false doctrine? It's easy. Every one of them that believed received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And God was able to say, Church, I haven't finished talking. I, he would speak to them prophetically. He would speak to them through the prophetic. He would use the gifts of the Spirit. And by doing this, He would guide the church. That's why the early church was far more spiritual than the church is today. Because today, we've got churches that are so tied up with the legalisms of the book. Mm -hmm. That they don't rely on the Spirit anywhere near like the first church did, like the early church did, like the first believers did. They didn't have the book. They had to rely on the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't have the book. They had to rely on tongues and interpretation. They didn't have the book. They had to rely on the gift of prophecy. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Children, I want you to understand God isn't finished talking. He's still talking today. Why is he still talking? Because the God we serve revealed himself in the man Jesus Christ. He went to the cross. He died for our sins. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven only so that he could physically remove himself so that he might spiritually restore himself. He could not come as the Holy Ghost until he left as the man Jesus Christ. That's why he said, I've got to go. You folks don't understand. In order for me to come back and live in each and every one of you, physically i got to leave. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so much more, friend, than a belief system based on ancient writings. In John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, the Lord said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In John chapter 16, almost done today, verses 12 through 14, Jesus said, Listen, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come. So when is the Lord going to finish saying what He needs to say? <coughs> Later? No. When? After the Spirit has come, he said. That's when he's going to finish saying what he needs to say. He said, I have many things, yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. God is telling us today, I haven't finished speaking. That's why the Holy Ghost is there for you, because I haven't finished talking, folks. I'm still talking. If you'll shut up long enough to listen, I'll talk to you. You Baptist folk, if you'll shut up preaching what you think you know long enough so I can fill you with the Holy Ghost, then you'll find out I have a lot more to say than what you think I have to say. Have the Lord waited on Peter to finally come to an understanding of inclusion as it related to the Gentile world, we might not be part of the New Testament church to this day. The Spirit of God is given to the church as a means of direct communication. 
The Lord cannot convey everything to us by reason of the written page. So He has given us His Spirit, which continues to speak on His behalf. So the next time you think the Bible has all the answers, stop and consider this. The Lord may have more to say on the subject that you're contemplating than that which has been written. Think about that for a minute. The Lord may have more to say on the subject than what's been written about it. And if we're smart, we'll stop long enough to hear the Master say, I haven't finished speaking. Hallelujah. I haven't finished speaking. Glory to God. I would not be preaching the affirming message I preach today if it weren't for the fact that God is still talking. If it weren't for the fact that for years God was trying to talk to me and convince me and help me to understand things that I thought I fully understood. But when it come down to it, I didn't understand nothing. <laughs> the sad part is, I really didn't understand half of what I thought I understood. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. Because it's that Spirit of God that dwells in us, which helps us to hear His voice. Even in a backslidden state, the voice of God was speaking to me. And I'm so glad He brought me to where I am today. Amen. I haven't.